Um, just do a group of them there. And I watch them out. And that's what makes it so fast because they're the whole size is small. So that's what I can say. It's like super overpowered. I see. How small is it? Okay, so interesting. Thanks. So the got a whole lot of assignment or announcements here, changes. We're just going to finish up the middle of this unit. So now to sort of decide what's going to be in uh, the next uh, lecture, the last lecture of this week, then I'll finalize assignment G and be able to make that available. It'll be due um, middle of next week. Um, only other small changes or small, I don't know, peculiarity is that um, in the content that I put together for um, Thursday, I decided to throw in a lot more uh, video content. Uh, and so that instead of being um, this thing that I do, it will be a more traditional PowerPoint lecture that the, and I put the PowerPoint uh, up available instead of the instructor's notes. It's pretty large, it's like 400 megabytes because of uh, the, the digital content. So I've also included a PDF version um, for those of you that are downloading those, reading those. Uh, of course, the PDF version is more portable for following along, but doesn't have any of the videos embedded in it. So uh, that's going to be a little bit different for next time and all that's uh, available there. That's pretty much it. So things are just moving right along. So um, I hope everybody is putting thought into their creative projects. Um, you know, there's coming up here, I think it's probably the end of next week is where there's a, a check-in where Oh, it's the end of next week or the next week after that. I have to Canvas to be sure, but you know, just basically it's a, a short statement saying how things are going, if things have any changes, those sorts of things. So, any questions or concerns? All right, great. So, um, in this chapter, really the focus of the previous two sections in this unit. Or how do we get organization at evolutionary scale? So how do we get patterns of diversity across organisms? And in these two sections, uh, so today and Thursday, it's really about how do we explain patterns um, at an individual time scale? So not um, let's, you know, why are things different across different species, but within a species, why do they do things the way they do? and specifically focus on, on the intersection of information and living systems. So, um, so that's kind of was the, the big thing here. And, um, and so, you know, information is the key word for these two uh, units, which we've learned, you know, about ways to, to define information, um, in terms of information theory. So things that relate to kind of entropy. But you know, the word information is a bit looser as it kind of went over in the chapter. There's also this related word of computation um, and so on. So um, before I get into the chapter, um, I did just want to mention kind of a tidbit that uh, the first um, study to apply. Um, information theory to a non-human system uh, was a study by uh, Haldane and uh, Spurway. Uh, Spurway happened to be his, his wife. Um, and this you know, power couple, this was in 1954. And I just kind of mentioned this because where have we seen the name Haldane before? Anybody remember from recently? Um, well, I, I looked him up because he's in the mainstream. He was uh, like attributed with neo Darwinism. So, uh, kind of like any ideas pertaining to Darwin and Mendel and things like that. Right. He was one of the three sort of uh, folks associated with the modern synthesis. So, that was Fisher, Haldane, and Wright. And so um, Haldane was big into, you know, studying these evolutionary patterns, you know, kind of population genetics, those sorts of things. But in general, was interested in these other patterns as well. So um, 
you see, it's interesting seeing some of the same names pop up in slightly different contexts. So, um, so yeah, this Haldane and Spurway article was the first time that they, so basically information theory had just kind of hopped up. Um, uh, you know, it was um, Claude Shannon was uh, working at Bell Labs. He was a mathematician, an electrical engineer, trying to study communication theory, how to build systems that could encode, um, can code in useful signals over wires, you know, things that became our modern telephone system and so on, came from studies of information theory. And as he published this framework, that people like Haldane, who had kind of theoretical mind, picked it up and applied it to apply it to something different. And um, in this Haldane and Spurway um, example, they applied it to honeybees. So how many people have heard of the Waggle Dance? Anybody? So not, not, not many, okay. So but so honeybees have a way of communicating with each other called a Waggle Dance. And so the basic idea uh, behind a, uh, a Waggle Dance is you've got a hive somewhere with a honeybee colony in it. And <clears throat> there is a flower patch or somewhere. So let's say there's a flower over here. And uh, that flower is at some distance away from the hot. Now, um, honeybees fly. And so you learned in the chapter, we'll get to that, about ants that are able to recruit to sites by laying chemicals on the ground. And honeybees can't do that, right? Because they're in the air. So they can't lay a trail in the air because it would just blow away. Um, and so they do need a way to communicate the position of potential source, uh, sources of nectar and pollen to their nestmates. So what these honeybees do is uh, they uh, will use, so the sun will be somewhere out. And if we imagine the hive is somewhere down the ground, the sun's up in the air. And so you can imagine that if you project the sun down to sort of a point on the ground somewhere, say I'll say it's right here, then you can imagine there's then an angle from the hive to that to the sun basically, and you can take um, you can take the angle between that direction, wherever the sun is and where the flower is, and now you've got a polar coordinate for the flower. So all if you can somehow communicate those two pieces of information to another bee, you can tell another bee, hey, I found a flower at forty two degrees um, twenty kilometers away. And that bee could go there. And that's what honeybees came up with as a way to uh, communicate to each other. So, um, so if we sort of cut to um, inside the hive, if you are I'm looking at, say, to keep it simple, because honeybees have a way of compensating for all sorts of interesting things. So just to keep it simple, if we imagine a vertical slice of honeycomb, so there's, uh, so we're imagine we're just looking at a vertical slice of cone. And so we're just kind of staring at it and there's bees walking on this vertical slice. So imagine the wall here. So these little squares on my grid paper, imagine they're hexagons. And so there's cells of this honeycomb. And so we've got an up direction. This is up, which is just away from gravity. And so what a bee that has found a flower will do is she'll come back to the cone and she will pick a spot. Um, and it's a spot, a special spot in the hive called the dance floor. We're called the dance floor because they don't know. I mean, maybe they do, I don't know. But, um, but uh, and so they go there. And uh, what the bee will do is that she, so I'm going to sort of I do my best to draw something that's bee-like. So here's kind of a body, 
Um, here's sort of the four wings of the bee, something along those lines. Pretend that's a bee. And, uh, and so she'll position herself at an angle that corresponds to the same angle as over here. But this angle will be relative to up. And then what she does is that she will start to uh, waggle back and forth this way. So she gets to a particular point, and then she will loop around. So this is the direction. Then she'll waggle again, and then she'll loop around again in a series of figure eights over and over and over again. So she does these figure eights. And um, the, as I said, the angle she does this dance corresponds to that angle. And it turns out that the length of uh, this, uh, of this waggle run, we call it, corresponds to distance. So for example, I think it's like about one second of waggle run is like one kilometer. So if you, you can, put these in an observation high. And if you ever go to a spot like, uh, I don't know, um, there's, uh, there's several spots um, that are sort of public places, probably the zoo somewhere, um, either the Butterfly Wonderland or something in Scottsdale, where they have observation hives of honeybees. And if you ever get a chance to look at one, just sit there, I'll give you these questions in just a second, just sit there and watch. And I guarantee eventually you'll see some of these. And if you get good at it, you can start reading them. So, um, so colleagues of mine, I study ants, but colleagues of mine study bees, and they can look at these and they can say, yeah, she's dancing for a patch that's about three kilometers that way, she's dancing for a patch that's five kilometers that way, and so on. So you can just read what they're dancing for. And other bees will follow along behind her. They sort of, you'll see a cluster of them all around them. And they kind of just, yeah, I mean, as she's trying to do her little figure eight thing, and she just got this retinue that's just sort of tightly bundled around them. And those will be the ones that after um, they follow her for enough time, will they go off and then fly off in that direction? Yeah, question. Oh, I was going to say that I see the butterfly wonderland before. It's pretty cool. You can see the actual beehive, and they're all like coming out of the, the thing. Well, yeah, I thought that, they, that there was a, a, an observation hive up there. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. I have two questions. I don't know if you were going to explain it, um, but so the angle for the sun, um, how does that work if the sun is like moving? Wouldn't that change where the shadow is? That's an excellent question. They compensate. So um, if so, she might be dancing for this flower um, for a relatively long period of time, um, and as the sun moves in the sky, she updates her angle. Yeah. Wow. Um, and also, um, when she starts the dance, is there some sort of like, it's like in code and DNA, there has to be something that starts where you start the DNA in the code. So like, like hand dancing. Yeah, is there some like movement that it makes? Yeah, I mean, this, this is what we would call is a stereotyped behavior. So whenever we talk about the evolution of communication, there's something that a guy named Timberby came up with called Q ritualization. So eventually you get something that's ritualized. Like once upon a time, the words coming out of my throat were physiological sounds that corresponded to breath noise and things like that. But eventually, um, uh, humans evolved the ability to co-opt those with things that have nothing to do with physiology and totally do with communication. That's the same thing here. This movement, this, this like, and they go around figure eights, that never happens naturally. It only happens when they're dancing. So that's, she doesn't have to actually do some like come hither. Um, you could imagine that she could release a pheromone or something like that and bring them. But this is so stereotyped that when a bee starts doing this, the other bees notice and they come and they read the thing. Well, I guess what I mean is like, if, if the amount she, she walks is so specific, if she started and people didn't pay attention when they get the wrong distance oh, well, or something like the, that. The, the bees that read them um, will end up We'll end up following her around several runs. So if she's in the middle of a run, so let's say she's going to do this for six seconds or something like that. Well, if she's like already done two seconds before B comes and follows, it will sort of follow her all the way around until she recycles. 
so that it gets a whole run. Oh, so when so when it's it's not repeating one kilometer twenty times to get twenty kilometers, it would be walking for twenty seconds. And then recycle another twenty seconds. Oh, another okay. 20 seconds. Like yeah, that's that. what I, I thought it was like. Mm -hmm. okay. And here's another sort of interesting thing. So calling in Texas. So there's a bee sleep. So, um, so and, and so you can deprive them of sleep. And, um, and one of the things he does, he, he built this thing called an insominator, his name. Um, and he has straps uh, and he had control bees that had aluminum on the back of them and the uh, treatment bees that had steel on the back of them. And it's basically, you know, legs drop high, it's like a bunch of vertical hives, but he had a strong magnet that would periodically just buzz down at the hive. And every bee that would have a steel thing on the back of it would get vibrated. And this prevents them from sleeping. And when you deprive a honeybee of sleep, her waggle runs stop being so straight. They start looking kind of drunken, like they'll go off at one angle, and then when she life cycles around, they'll walk at another angle, and so on. And it turns out that those bees that are kind of doing these drunken waggle runs don't get as many followers. So bees, um, you could say, can recognize, it might just be that it doesn't look enough like a waggle run, but either way, it's just like if someone was like constantly falling asleep and trying to tell you like, you know, where to go or whatever, you might not trust them. Turns out the same thing too, is that exhausted bees that don't do a good back run don't get followers. Yeah. Um, so you could say that's synonymous with the example of the reading about the ants that don't, I already forget the word, so it's the bee. Fair? Yeah, fair, yeah. It, it, so you could say that that's synonymous with the, the amount of ants, that, or the amount of pheromites that ants distribute basically because they talked about how sometimes like it's thicker than others mm -hmm. and easier to differentiate than others. Yeah, I mean you yeah, they, right, right. So you can and, and there actually is an enthusiasm to the kind of going like, but absolutely right. You can imagine that you can modulate this signal um, by you know how straight it is. And just like in the ants, you can kind of modulate um, how much pheromone you're laying down. And that, that changes how track it is. Absolutely sure. Yeah. I have so many questions about this, but specifically relating to evolution. Um, is this a trait that the bees learn and then pass down? Or is this like something that's like distinguishable for the bees? Like if you isolated like newborn bees, would they just start doing this? Yes, they would. This is um, an instinctual, this is not something that the bees learn. There are things like, so another colleague who studies bumblebees, these are honeybees, and bumblebees don't do waggle uh, runs to recruit. Bumblebees, that's sort of an interesting thing, when they have what's known as a blackboard, um, where they basically just go and tell other bees there are more flowers out there. And so um, it's just, a, you need to go and search because there's good stuff out there, so it's signal. So they don't communicate this. Uh, but bumblebees, you can train, um, so there's a guy, um, maybe I'll put his name up here. He gets a lot of great press, uh, Lars Chipka. And this is Bumblebees. And if you were to search for him on just plain old Google or you know Google News or whatever, then you'll find some of his stuff. And even you, you could even search for like soccer Bumblebee. That would be another one. So Lars can train bumblebees to do lots of interesting things. Like he can have a bumblebee go and um, learn to pull. In order to get a feeder, it has to. There's a disc that has sugar on it, but it's behind a wall with kind of a, a small crack under it. So you have to pull a string to get the disc out to get to the feeder. And he can train individual bees to uh, learn how to do this. And once they learn how to do it, very rapidly. The rest of the bees in the colony immediately know how to do it. So, um, so apparently there is social learning there. The interesting thing, Lars recently uh, put together an experiment where he built a puzzle, um, kind of like one of those puzzles you give your dogs or whatever to sort of enrich them. You have to pull, move some pegs around in order to get treats out. And this puzzle could be solved in two different ways, get the same the magnitude of treat out. And what Lars could show is that. Bees that would naturally figure out on their own. They wouldn't be trained one way or the other, but they could just figure out which one they would they, the one The bee that would figure out um, which, like, to go left instead of right to get the tree that way, its colony would then be suddenly full of all left, uh, you know, tree goers. 
And so it would bring that information. So that's an example where there are in these social insect colonies um, social learning, where one learns it and it suddenly spreads through the colony. But this communication uh, skill, it is a phenotype, it is a trait. Um, uh, this is something that has evolved over evolutionary time scale, and these have it sort of immediately. Yeah, so, great question. And um, the honeybees that we're familiar with, the Glyphus mellifera, um, those bees live inside cavities, and they have one side of the wagon road. Now, you go over um, on the other side of the world, kind of Australasia region, region, and you'll find a bunch of open nesting um, honeybees. So these are bees that don't live in colonies. So when you look up on trees, like so in the springtime, you'll often see swarms of honeybees here waiting to pick their next nest, but they live inside the nest. Well, there are open nesting bees of different species, like Apis sporea, that, that live again on the other side of the world. And their nests are totally exposed. And they have a much simpler waggle room where if a flower is there, they just will angle toward the flower and then do this figure eight thing. So they don't have to figure out, um, you know, this translation between up and an azimuth of the sun or whatever. Um, they just, the angle is kind of easier because as long as they have a horizontal surface, then they just tell the other bees uh, that direction and then the link tells them how far to go in that direction. So you can imagine that that type of waggle run evolved first and they gradually got to this more derived form as these bees started to take up the niche of living in cavities. Other questions about this basic wow. So it's cool, right? These can do this. I didn't even get to help them with spur weight. So this, this whole thing was decoded uh, by a Nobel Prize winner named Von Frisch. Uh, sort of one of the three founders of behavioral ecology, uh, Von Frisch, Tim Bergen, and Lorenz. Um, now, uh, Haldane and Spurway come around, and Haldane says, you know, this is a communication channel. So if you remember when we started talking about information theory in Mitchell's book, she said that you could, you, could count, you could characterize like channel capacity, like how much information can I send on a channel and stuff like that. And so in this paper, by Haldane and Spurway, they basically watch a bunch of bees follow waggle runs or follow waggle dances. And, um, and then they would sort of calculate, we know where this bee came from. We know where it was apparently nominally dancing for. And then we know where the followers went to. And the followers wouldn't always go exactly to that flower. So it's like it was a noisy communication channel. Like the followers would go roughly to the right area. They wouldn't go exactly in the right spot. So the question was, what's the resolution of this communication? And they used information theory. Um, they used Shannon information to characterize all of this sort of stuff. And um, what they basically found is that, without getting into the details, but the directional information, if we just focus on direction, you could really not refine things down to more than like 10 degree steps. In other words, there were, um, you can think of it as having sort of three or four bits of information. So we were having 32 options. So I can't tell you precisely where to go, but I can say it's either this 10 degrees, that 10 degrees, that 10 degrees, and so on. So there's a noise about this kind of direction. Now, what they said initially is they said, okay, that might just be the limitation of the bee. Like this is a noisy communication, that's just the best you could do. But then what they speculate towards the end, and this sort of points to stuff that's in this chapter, which is why I'm bringing it up, is that, so I can, I'll just mention this here. So uh, waggle dance. Waggle dance, um, you know, uh, noisy communication. Um, angle resolution limited to 10 degree slices. And so we can say, is this a limitation just of the communication channel or is it adaptive? 
And so what how did it spur way start to speculate on that? It's like at first you think it's just it's just a B, that's the best they can do. But then you really think about it, like, well, maybe they really could do a little better. If you kind of think about the mechanics of it, maybe, maybe they really probably get it down to five degrees or whatever. But or you can say, but then let's say they could do perfectly, and you could have one B could lead another B directly to the exact flower. Why is that a good idea to do? Um, because you know that flower is going to be deplete of all of the nectar or all of the pollen that the other bee has gotten from. You don't want to bring a new bee to the same flower. But if you found a flower there, there's probably flowers right next nearby. So the thought here is that how can it possibly be adaptive? Well, maybe the communication is not communicating a location. Maybe it's communicating a prediction. So really they're communicating a prediction of where another flower might be. And if you looked at where the followers uh, for any, if a bee, if a, if a, if a hive was here, and the flower the bee was dancing for was here. If you looked at where the followers went, um, you would get this bell curve of followers where most of them would be pretty close to the flower that's being danced for, but they'd all be scattered around that. The average would be exactly where the flower was being danced for, uh, but there would be a variance there. And the thought was that that variance, that could be tuned to the habitat like you can imagine that bees that evolved in habitats where had, had very that had a large patchy di distributions where where there's one flower there could be a field of flowers. Well, in that case, they might have really noisy waggle dances. And bees that evolved in areas where if you found one flower, it'd be a tight patch that would be really close by. Well, then maybe those no waggle dances would be less noisy. And so the noise could be tuned. By evolution to spatial variability in the habitat. And so we're seeing that noise is not actually uh, uh, something that's, that's bad here. The noise is being co-opted as something that um, can be used to spread individuals out in a useful way. So that's maybe the, the bigger picture here is that noise spreads individuals out. And that helps with exploration. Because if you remember at the end of the chapter, Mitchell talks about this exploration exploitation trade-off. This idea of having focused search and unfocused search. So totally focused would be to go to the flower, unfocused would be go anywhere else. And this communication scheme balances the two of them. It doesn't bring bees to the exact flower, but it refocuses the distribution to be around that flower. And that seems to be what makes the waggle dance adapt for the two. So questions about that idea? I just want to bring that up because how the end we've seen before, information theory that we've seen before, um, and the general message that wasn't mentioned in Mitchell, but it, it links right to Mitchell's case too, is again, this idea that noise um, helps us balance um, this idea of, of the private and the public, of what you found and where you want to put everyone else based on what's This is supposed to be individual and exploration. So I'll see if I can clean that up. Individual exploration. Okay. All right, so that's my little intro to um, the types of things that motivated um, this chapter. All right, but um, 
But of course, uh, Mitchell doesn't start with um, with ants or social insects. Uh, she starts with the immune system. So, what do you guys tell me about the immune system? So, um, how uh, what what sort of an interesting thing that you remember about her description of how the? Well, let me also give a little the background here is when we talk about the immune system, really we're talking about the vertebrate immune system. And the vertebrate immune system, vertebrates, that's me, you, uh, all the mammals, all the birds, anything with a, a, a backbone. Um, and, uh, and there's two parts of the vertebrate immune system. There's the so-called innate immune system. And this is what uh, gives you a fever. It, what it does wound healing. Um, it is um, a generic response to an intruder. Um, and it's very, very old evolutionarily. So we can look at the molecular signatures of the innate immune system, and we can find things even in plants that match up. So the innate immune system goes back to a, a way pretty close to the common ancestor of all life. And so, um, you know, so this is, you know, not just uh, so it's plants, animals, um, and others, um, even I think even some bacteria, there are some mechanisms of bacteria that we still see um, analogs for in our innate immune system. But the point here is that as a generic response, it has no memory. Um, so it does not adapt. So yeah, this is not what we talked about in the chapter. The chapter was the next. next yeah. Um, how how does it not how would an immune system not adapt? What it not adapt is it doesn't learn about the invaders. So um, if you cut me, there's one way that that, that wound heals. If I have an infection, um, a generic response to an infection is to have a fever. A fever is just going to cook anything in my body. It's not tailored for a specific thing. So it is a general purpose defense. When the body detects that it has a foreign thing inside, that's your innate immune system. And then but it can still adapt over time, like over like well, it doesn't really change. I mean, it, it, it can develop. I mean, you can have sort of a different innate, your innate immune system can get weaker or stronger over time. But um, I but I meant like natural selection. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, when I say adapt, I, I, now we're talking again light history scale. So are you adapting on a light history scale, on a, a history of an individual organism? So then the other, um, so that's one half. Then the half that um, the other type of immune system is the adaptive or acquired immune system. And um, this is vertebrate specific, although um, there are now um, you know, new, there is some convergent evolution or there's evidence of convergence in other taxa. So I'll put a question mark there. So we sort of assume that there's no adaptive immune system in ants, for example. But now people studying um, the immunology of how invertebrates work are starting to find that, you know, there actually are some things that seem to have a type of immune memory that uh, builds up over time and amount to specific response. And so we don't think that it's the same immune system that we have, but we think it has the same function. That's what I mean by it's convergent. Um, and so, you know, this, and the big point of the adaptive immune system is it provides specialized responses to infection. So it's kind of like 
you know, you don't want to get um, if you have a specific immune response already built into your body, you don't have to mount to fever every time um, you know you get a virus in you or that you've seen before, because your body will just say, "All right, I got this." It has a very specific response to that. If your body doesn't have that specific response, then you might have to mount um, a more generic response that will make you feel really sick. Uh, but the specific response. As we learned, it might make your lymph nodes all over your body pop up as they start building some of the specific response, but you're not gonna feel that generic sickness that you do from your innate immune system. Um, so it also provides immune or another word used for that is plasticity. So um, biologists like to use the word plastic for lots of things. Um, you can think of it as like a plastic deformation, a piece of plastic. If you stretch it, it doesn't come back, right? It stays there. So it's, it, it, it didn't learn there, but it was changed. And so that's why plasticity means it can, yeah, it, you can it, uh, things can leave an imprint on it. Um, so you can also say, well, it's, it's got adaptation or adapt. it's adaptive. That's why it's called the adaptive immune system. Um, and so that's the, the key um, features of the adaptive immune system. And this is really uh, what uh, Mitchell, uh, you know, the chapter focuses on. And it turns out that these two immune systems, the innate and adaptive, do inside our bodies work together. Um, it's kind of a cool thing. Um, we learned about antigens. Your innate immune system, if it, if it finds something that's like, this is not right, I found some foreign thing. If there are antigens on that thing, the, the, the innate immune system has these special cells that will kind of kill the thing and then find the antigens and then bubble them up to the surface and then come over to the adaptive immune system and say, hey, I found this antigen. Maybe you should know about it. And that's called antigen uh, presentation. And so uh, your, your innate immune system can present antigens to your adaptive immune system so they can start the process of mounting a specific response for later infection. So they can work together in these two systems, but it gets really complicated. So we looked at a very simple thing. So tell me, what did anybody take away? From, like, what are some parts? of this system that Mitchell talked about? What are some cells that are talked about? How does it work? Um, any reflections? What did you take away? Yeah. They talked a lot about um, B and T cells. Okay, so that was so, does anyone remember the generic name for B and T cells? It starts with an L. Yeah. Lymphocytes. Lymphocytes, that's right. And there are a bunch of different types of lymphocytes. In the chapter, they focused on B cells and T cells. And if I had to give a nutshell of what these things do, the B cells focus on uh, recognition and antibody production. And the T cells focus on um, actual, um, a, a, a like killing the infection, so I'll say defense and regulating other cells. So part of what the T cells job is, is to keep the B cells from going crazy. So the two of them kind of work together. Um, for this class, I really am most interested in you knowing most about the B cells. Um, this whole idea of information and living systems or whatever, uh, most of, uh, in, if you start getting into the weeds when you start getting into the T cells, most of the important things that you should know about, but actually relate to things like COVID and all the rest of this sort of stuff. Um, if we just know about the B cells, we kind of have, you know, 90% of what's going on in the immune system. So what can we tell about B cells? Do you remember anything about B cells? Yeah. There's a good amount of like natural selection occurring there. So um, I, I don't remember 
exactly the process, but um, essentially if these B cells are being produced and if they don't um, like bind to correctly, then they essentially just kind of lose their function and don't. I guess you say it's paid. Yeah, right. So it's good. Yeah, there, there's, there are actually so there are two types of um, of selection that we talk about with them: positive and negative. And the I think the big thing about B cells. So what what's like when we talk about natural selection, something's got to be changing. What's changing about the B cells? What's the, the phenotype of the B cells that's that's changing? Yeah. Um, how well it can, how the the antigens fit into the um, receptors. receptors. That's right. Yeah. So we can just say the B cell receptors or the BCR. Um, these are highly variable. So, um, so basically, when a, a B cell first comes to, into existence, uh, there is a process um, that was not talked about in the chapter, and you don't have to know this term, but we can put it up there um, so that you know you've seen it before, called VDJ recombination. Because I don't want you to think this is all about mutation. It's not like B cells are there like. They go to a special part of your body that's exposed to cosmic rays and they just wait for mutations. There's actually something that's a lot like card shuffle in your body. So um, basically when B cells are made in your, your bone marrow, you've got these three types of DNA, B, D, and J, that have a bunch of different sort of um, uh, ways that they can be put together. In fact, you know, there's basically, um, I think, something like 10 to the 11 ways they can be reorganized. So those of you sort of you know, take a bio class, might have, you know, heard the term recombination. Um, what's recombination normally associated with? Three-letter word, starts with an S. With an X, sex. So, um, so normally recombination is when you have male DNA, female DNA come together, and half of it goes, um, half is taken from each in order to go into the offspring. And so we recombine um, DNA that was once in together, all in the male or all in the female. We take a little bit of one, a little bit of the other, we put them back together in a different way, and that's how you get this mixture in your next offspring and through sexual reproduction. There is a special form of recombination that just goes on in the production of these B cells that takes your DNA just in these cells and recombines it in a sort of similar way um, so that it produces offsprings that have variability the same way offspring of male and female are variable from the male from the parents. And so when we do talk about daughter cells and things like that, we really are, they, they, their offspring do vary um, in um, you know, how their DNA put these things together. But it's not mutation, it's just kind of reshuffling of the DNA. So that once the cell um, comes into existence, it's set, it has a phenotype, and that phenotype is its receptor structure. So this is a, um, you know, this is a, Phenotypes so or receptors are phenotype of um, each B cell. <clears throat> and they may match to antigens from pathogens. So you make antigen, pathogen, um, these two are associated together, so pathogen, that's the invader. Um, but they also may match to uh, cells from own body. And so we call this the self you know, versus non-self problem. And 
And um, as we'll see downstream here, whenever a B cell matches to anything, it gets, it puts a little marker on it, a stamp on it. And anything that has that, that mark, that scarlet letter or whatever, is gonna get targeted by the rest of the system. You do not want to have an antibody from a B cell stamped on you. That's gonna be bad. And, um, and so this opens up the uh, opportunity for autoimmune disorders. So we know what auto means? Self, Self right. So this is an immunity, you can get an immunity to yourself. Um, Michael Jackson, for example, had a famous autoimmune disorder. And, uh, and uh, that autoimmune disorder was the reason why his skin got lighter and lighter and lighter throughout uh, his whole life. Um, because the melanocytes in his body got targeted by his own immune system. And so the things that produced melanin that would make him black over his lifetime were gradually destroyed by his own immune system. And that's the reason why his skin got lighter and lighter and lighter. So that's an example of uh, an, an autoimmune disorder. There are tons of other autoimmune disorders. Lupus, for example, um, which can be very painful. People can get red marks on them, things like that. Multiple sclerosis, that's when your immune system attacks your own nerves. And, um, and because it destroys their, the sheets that kind of insulate your nerves, your nerves fail to work. And that uh, creates kind of a paralysis and numbness. Um, there's a bunch of other autoimmune disorders that just come from this um, unfortunate problem that when you just randomly generate uh, these B cells, receptors, um, there is a decent probability you were going to generate a pattern that matches your, some, one, some set, your subset of your cells. And so to prevent that from happening, that's where we have um, negative selection. And so this goes on in your bone marrow, but you know, I think primarily in your thymus. And it's really clever. Basically, before a B cell can be dispatched to sort of float through the length of your body, um, it has to go through a quality control region in your thymus, where there's a bunch of little go-no-go -no -go samples. And so it has a bunch of chemical samples of yourself. And if any of those match to a B cell, that B cell is either reabsorbed or reconfigured. It basically is not allowed to move on in its current state. And that hopefully um, removes, so matches to self are removed. And that's called negative selection. So there's a background of random B cells, and only a small set of them, as yourself, are excluded. The rest go on as a group negative selection. Does that make sense? Negative selection. I, don't know, I think it's pretty cool that your body's got your thymus just sitting there with little samples of yourself constantly screening these B cells and getting rid of the ones that. Uh, hopefully, you can create this. But at any time in your life, you could still create a B cell that gets past your thymus and starts uh, attacking you. So you can get one of the autoimmune disorders later on. And, but hopefully, other mechanisms like those T cells that I was talking about um, uh, are provide additional defense against this, but still it will happen. Is there a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was just, it's not the only. Thing that no, no, this is the main way, but then, yeah, apps, there are other regulatory mechanisms afterwards that can help as well. But I don't want to focus on this one because it relates really well to selection and all that. Sort of thing. Now, the other uh, side of it was brought up as positive selection. And so um, the thing here is B cells never perfectly match an antigen. So an antigen can come in, and if it doesn't quite hit the receptor just right, it's not going to pair up because they're not really quite a perfect match, or it won't stay paired up. 
But so if, if a, a B cell happens to get a hit, a partial hit, then uh, the, that B cell, um, uh, well, it starts, it, it triggers antibody production. So a partial hit triggers antibody production. So you can think um, body, you know, like antigen, antibody, gen, pathogen, body, body. So the body is yours, the gen is theirs. Um, so it triggers antibody production. And those antibodies are basically little portable receptors that, uh, that um, turn off viruses and they uh, mark others for targeting. Um, so that's what the antibodies is. They're just these floating things that are floating around and they get in the way of viruses to prevent them from doing their job. And then um, other parts of the immune system look for them and then uh, flush them from your system. So you don't want antibodies that are now parked on, for example, your melanocytes, um, because then other parts of your body will come and destroy your melanocytes. And that's again, what happened to Michael Jackson. Um, and so um, so that's, but they're not perfect. So the other thing that when you get a partial match that happens is that you also, um, the B cells start reproducing um, in lymph nodes, uh, daughter B cells that vary slightly. And this variance um, allows for natural selection takes over after this. So if there's now a variance that makes the receptor slightly better, it's going to match even more antigens. That B cell is going to release a bunch more antibodies. And then it is going to trigger production of more cells that look like it. And that will gradually create um, will refine this population of daughter cells to be fine-tuned to this particular antigen. And then your body will keep around some of them, which are known as uh, memory B cells. Uh, and they provide a uh, response for later infections. So after you clear this infection, some of those uh, highly matched, high affinity B cells stay in your system so that the next time you get that same infection, uh, they're already there and they can just short circuit this and start immediately producing antibodies to take care of the thing before it becomes a major problem. And so that's the positive selection side of it. And those are kind of the two big things I want you to take away from the adaptive immune system. Random production of B cell phenotypes combined with negative selection to prevent problems and positive selection to fine tune. And that's going on all the time. And that's how your body uh, manages to learn about all the pathogens in the world and build specific responses to each one. So, questions about that? And by the way, I guess I'll mention that um, I'm going to flip back to negative selection. Um, another name for negative selection that you'll hear is central tolerance. So you tolerate yourself. This whole immunology is really very fascinating. And if you ever um, get into an opportunity to sort of look more detailed into it, Especially during this information stuff, I mean, effectively, each one of your cells has a little password, um, and that when you're when you're born, you're sort of given this kind of this this like your there's even theory. So it's called this histocompatibility compatibility complex, and every cell's got a little expresses this little again. It's like a password. 
that my password is different than my mom's password or my dad's password, which means that um, you know that might create problems if I ever wanted to accept an organ from them or they accept an organ from me. Um, but it's meant to create this individuality, and it's so important for us all to have different passwords that mice actually show sexual preference for mice that have a different histocompatibility complex. So it's possible that when you're choosing a partner that you might mate with, um, you actually choose one that has a high probability of producing an offspring who will have a unique password of their own. So um, in this password thing, this all has to go with the self non self sort of stuff. It's that, you know, so it's it's um because you don't want um, there to be a common password that's out there because then uh, viruses and things like that could just come up with it on their own. And there would be a group of people that they could infect, and the immune system wouldn't be able to tell it's a virus. It would look just like them. So uh, that's just amazing stuff that goes on in the immune system, um, even in just a plain old innate immune system. But once you combine the two together, it's really a beautiful system. But for this class, if you know negative selection, positive selection, and you can sort of talk through how negative selection prevents autoimmune disease and positive selection creates specific responses, then you've got the sort of all that I want you to know about this. Focus entirely on these things. Are there any questions about any of that? All right, well, um, I'm going to close here with some examples, her examples talking about ants. Um, I wasn't that interested in her metabolism examples. They were pretty sparse anyway. Um, but I do want to at least start the ant thing because I'm going to talk a lot about, so Mitchell sort of gave you the kind of bare minimum of how some people think ants work. Um, on Thursday, I'm going to give you the, the much more richer version of other mechanisms that ants do that will make them much more interesting than I think Mitchell made them uh, here. But we should talk at least about what um, Mitchell's sort of basic picture um, of ants, um, specifically um, with pheromones and trails. Because this is kind of the basic picture that you might hear in any sort of textbook about ants. So already this term pheromone has been brought up. And it should look to you like hormone. Um, because a pheromone is basically a social hormone. So a hormone is a chemical that communicates between cells. So if you've heard of neurotransmitters between neurons, those are hormones. Um, so um, there's, you know, pretty much any time a cell secretes something which changes the behavior of another cell, that's a hormone um, or a type of hormone. And a pheromone is just basically a chemical communication between individuals. So these are secreted. These are excreted, but it's the same basic idea. But instead of um, a, 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 a um, in my endocrine system talking through you know, one organ to another, you can think of like my endocrine system talking to your endocrine system. That's kind of what pheromone is. And a lot of animals use pheromones. A lot of social insects use them quite a bit, probably more than we do. Um, these can be volatile. So, um, you know, imagine them uh, in air, uh, but they also uh, can be non volatile. Um, you can imagine them um, the, like they can be, for example, there can be greases um, on cuticle. So, every insect is covered with something called a cuticular hydrocarbon. It's just a grease. It's actually very similar to the grease that's on, on uh, plants to keep them from desiccating. It originally evolved to keep the insects from losing all their water, from desiccating. Uh, but it was co opted to be able to recognize. So, if you're producing your own wax to cover your skin, think of it as like moisturizing lotion, 
Um, if you can produce your own moisturizing lotion out of your skin, then you can start actually saying, you know what, I want my moisturizing lotion to smell more like me and your moisturizing lotion to smell more like you. So when ants go over and touch each other with their antennae, they smell through their antennae. And that's their way of smelling the grease that's on the back of another ant. And then sampling, you know, where have you been? Uh, are you from my colony? If you are from my colony, do you work in the nest area with the brood? Do you work in the trash area? And so on and so forth. And so those also can be considered pheromones because there's chemicals that are received, but they're not released in the air and they're not laid on the ground. They're actually just stuck on the body. So all of those can be considered pheromones and chemical communication. Um, so um, what's the basic idea behind the trail line? Like in a nutshell, um, how do how do in Melody Mitchell's picture, um, how do ants lead other ants to places where they found food? Yeah. Um, basically, when they find um, a, a resource, they release um, a, a pheromone, and I think it can even be specific to like how rich the resource is. Um, and so the more ants that go to that resource, um, the more, the stronger the pheromone path to be because more ants will follow that path and release the pheromone. Right, so yeah, so that's the big thing that I wanna, that I wanna emphasize there is that the initial finding of food is without a pheromone. Pheromones are not, in these ants, in most ants, except for a couple of ants that are totally blind, pheromones are not used for navigation. So not for navigation. An ant has no trouble, trouble <coughs> leaving its nest, finding the food source, and coming back to its nest. It doesn't need to leave breadcrumbs to get back to its nest. That's not what pheromones are for. Pheromones are for drawing the attention of other ants to what you found. So the idea here is that you have an ant that, you know, an ant leaves the nest and she walks around and, um, and then she finds a food source. And um, even though she's walked a circuitous path, she does something called path integration where she knows the straight path back to her nest. And she's able to then walk back to her nest in a roughly straight line. And she then lays chemical in this direction. And this, the amount that she lays can be proportional to how good the food is. She can lay a little, if it's very low concentration, doesn't have, there's not a lot there, um, or if it's really sweet, really sugary, maybe she lays a lot. Um, and if ants leave the nest and there's no pheromone, they'll just walk anywhere. But if there's a little bit of pheromone, they will have a tendency to walk in that direction. If there's a lot of pheromone, they'll have a very strong tendency to walk in that direction. So over time, you end up getting a buildup of ants that then leave the nest, are drawn to this trail, follow the trail, confirm that there is food there, grab a little bit of food, and then cycle back, and then lay their own trail. And remember that these are evaporating, it evaporates continuously. So if um, enough ants don't keep relaying it, the trail just keeps going away. But if you can get enough ants to there and they start laying it down faster than it's evaporating, then this just becomes a larger and larger attractant. And it will gradually bring, um, actually in most cases, all of the foragers to one site. So Mitchell talks about it spreading them out like according to quality. Um, in, in reality, and we'll talk about this uh, next time, we talk about linearity and nonlinearity. This type of recruitment is what we call nonlinear recruitment, and it generally collapses all of the foragers to one spot until that spot has been totally exploited. Then they stop reinforcing, and then they just all come back to the nest and they don't get more flesh. That's trailer. We'll pick up on that next time.
Um, so save your questions for that. Uh, meanwhile, a tennis exercise here. Uh, just tell me, um, give me um, which is produced by your body, the antigen or the antibody? Next time will be a very different experience. Lots of cool videos. Dance, dance, dance. Thank you. 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 Thank you.